Thank you, thank you, everyone. Let me um, go ahead and and um, and get us started. Before I introduce uh, to you our our special guest, um, Dr. Ann Feldman, I'd like to make two brief comments. The the first is that we're thrilled to have the chance to bring the greater GCNYC community together for what we hope will be one of many future opportunities to learn together actively. Dr. Feldman's presentation will lead us into breakout sessions that will mix the respective groups here tonight. Students continuing your degrees, students starting this term, our new group of fellows, alumni, faculty, staff, board members, and friends, uh, our connectedness, however we each relate to GCNYC is what makes this institution so special. Second, I'd like to lead us to stop, take a breath, and ponder water, you know, water that composes our bodies, water that we drink, water that grows the food we eat, water that cleanses, water that is increasingly scarce, poisoned, and expensive. So I'd like to invite us to just stop and take a little 30 second meditation break to meditate on the water in your life, water and justice, water and injustice on this planet that we inhabit. All right, thank, thank you for that. So my pleasure to go ahead and, and, and tell you a little bit about um, our guest because um, you know I could say a lot more. Dr. Feldman is a social entrepreneur, an artist, a teacher, and a role model uh, for us all. Dr. Feldman earned her PhD in the history of culture from the University of Chicago and is currently a visiting scholar in gender studies at Northwestern University and has produced numerous nationally and internationally syndicated television and radio programs, public events, and musical CDs. She's the founder and artistic director of Artistic Circles, a nonprofit organization founded over 30 years ago, which creates collaborative media projects to promote social change. Dr. Feldman has received numerous awards, including the Professional Achievement Citation from the University of Chicago Alumni Association, the Studs Turkel Humanities Award from the Illinois Humanities Council, the Gracie Allen Award from the Foundation for American Women in Radio and Television, Special Jury Award from the 7th International Radio Shanghai Music Festival, and the Why Women Award from YWCA. I'd like to tell you about all the fascinating work Dr. Feldman did after 9-11 to bring together Chicago's Muslim, Jewish, and Christian communities resulting in the award-winning Ties That Bind video documentary. I'd like to tell you about her 12-part radio documentary, Unbreakable Spirits, about women and girls in China, about her Grammy nominations for her musical CDs. For reasons of time, however, I will simply say that Dr. Feldman is an innovative activist educator. And we're thrilled to host her and collaborate with her on her current book project, which builds upon her recent documentary, Water Pressures, which has already won multiple awards and which she'll tell us about this evening. Uh, a word on the format before I turn the show over to Anne. Dr. Feldman will bring us into her fascinating story about water. And this story becomes the basis for my favorite kind of teaching case, what I call a live case, because the protagonist is with us to hear our ideas and share what actually happened. So please listen to the story. Don't worry about taking notes because uh, Dr. Feldman will reprise the key issues for the case before we break out. And, and please do feel free to use the chat box um, to interact uh, over the course of the presentation. So uh, with that, the floor is yours. And thank, thank you. you so much. Uh, first, I want to thank Jackie LeBlanc for inviting me to be part of this great event for Gaston and his incredible patience teaching me how to use PowerPoint on Zoom. And for uh, my friend Dan Benna, who is a great role model and a trustee of, of GCNYC. Um, I want to thank Bill Natale, who was our director for the Water Pressures documentary, and also um, Carol Jolnay, who helped write the case studies. If you don't remember anything else, I want you to remember that water is your future. It's not my future. It's your future. Um, 
one in nine people in the world lack safe water, one in three lack access to toilets. By 2050, when I will no longer be here, 57% of the world's water will be compromised. That means that's your future and you need to get involved. And that's why I'm here today is to get you all involved in your water futures. As you can see, we call this water pressures because of the pressures on all kinds of people around the world. Um, water pressures, first off, was a partnership that I helped create between Northwestern University and a water center in Rajasthan, India. It then became a documentary, which was syndicated throughout the US, Europe, India, Canada, and Australia. Our major sponsor was PepsiCo, thanks to Dan Benna. Now I'd like to show you a trailer from the documentary. Unlike most Americans, over 1.2 billion people can't go to the tap and get a clean drink of water. Water is something that we all take for granted here. We all take 15 minute showers in the morning. We take hot showers in the winter, but it keeps our daily life going, keeps us healthy, keeps us clean. For most every American, water is something we don't have to think about. A glass of water is mere steps away, but for others, a glass of water is as precious as gold. I can be virtually anywhere in the world, and I can get an email. Why is it that I can do that when we can't get safe water to prevent kids from dying? We've had wars over oil, but we can find other sources of energy. Water, that's it. You can't replace water with anything else. Last year, when 12 students from the U.S. realized there was a problem, they traveled to villages in India to experience the crisis firsthand. We're going to be following uh, one of the village elders around, so he's going to show me kind of the struggles that he experiences and how water comes to play in this uh, daily cycle. I was totally, totally freaked out. The students had one mission. I think the biggest thing that has stood out to me is like what it means to respect water. To collaborate with the villagers of Rajasthan and learn how to save the planet. You can make a change by adopting the practices of what the people are over here doing it. By conserving water and understanding the value of it and making people understand around you. I think right now we're at kind of you know, a tipping point. It's unfortunate that most people are forced to act in a time of scarcity. People here have been going green for thousands of years. What will happen if there's no water left in this planet? Personally, I think that it's people aren't really going to get it until it's too late. If water is the source of life, what happens when there's no more water? Water is a right! What happened to these 12 students in India changed their lives. Their story will change yours. And we have people who say that their lives have changed with that just one week. I mean, it was just actually one week there. It's a global problem. And it's fast becoming a global crisis. We just happen to be uh, in the middle of it. Water pressures. Once you see it, You'll never look at a glass of water the same again. Water pressures was a three-part process that we turned into a four-part process. Crisis, collaboration, exchange. And the part that we'll end up talking about today is action because without action, it's only a story. The story actually started in 2007 when I was caught in a water riot in India. 
I was in Southern India with my teacher, who's a Tibetan Buddhist monk. And we were driving to the airport when suddenly we came across burnt tires in the road, uh, burning trucks and cars. We saw uh, people looting shops on the side of the street and thousands of policemen standing at the ready. And I said to my teacher, you know, I'm from the Midwest, so I'm used to lots of water, the Great Lakes. And I said, what's going on? He said, this is a water riot. I said, well, why would anyone riot about water? And he gave me that kind of look, like he was very disappointed in me for not seeing what was in front of my eyes. That's when I decided to take this project to Northwestern and try and build a partnership. Now, Northwestern is a campus that sits on Lake Michigan. So you can see the extensive water here. And I took this problem to the facilities management office and said, I want to see your plan about water on the campus. And they said to me, we don't have a problem, we have flooding, which I think is quite a problem. Um, now the Great Lakes have 20% of the world's fresh water and Chicago gets 38 inches of rain a year and 35 inches of snow. That's 73 inches of precipitation. The have-nots in Rajasthan, India, get less than five inches of rain in the tar desert. And women can spend up to eight hours a day walking to get water. Um, our director, Bill Natali, and I saw these women. They're called the Panahari. And um, sometimes they carry two, three pots of water on their heads, a child under each arm or a pot under one arm and a child on their back. They can carry up to 88 pounds of water on their skeletons. And what I learned and what I shared with the administration in Rajasthan is these women's bodies were compromised. The skeletons were compromised. So I helped create a collaboration one of the biggest partners in this collaboration is your trustee, Dan Benna from PepsiCo. Dan came on as a corporate sponsor and our local sponsor in India was the Maharaja, which was, it was kind of like walking into a dream. Um, one of my board members, her son was doing a documentary about the Maharaja. I approached him and he agreed to partner. Um, but then what do you do when you have a partnership? You know, how do you show, not tell? And that's where the documentary came in. First, we had to build the collaboration. That was the most critical piece. And then we had to document it. And that's where the film crew came in. We filmed in India three times and I was in India four times in order to build trust. We had additional partners from government. On the left, you see Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky. On the right, you see students from academia, from Northwestern. We also partnered with Filter Pure Filters in the Dominican Republic. Many, many corporations like Tata Corporation in India and foundations. But then we also brought in media. Uh, celebrity Adrian Grenier, who you saw in the trailer, and various uh, TV stations across the nation. Then a uh, piece of luck was that through the head of the Jalbahagarathi Foundation in Rajasthan, we were able to get sponsorship from the United Nations Development Program, the UNDP. And the UNDP liked our idea to bring students to the deserts of Rajasthan to learn firsthand about water deprivation and to bring the leadership from the Jalbahagarathi Foundation to the US, to the Northwestern campus, and then to advocate with um, the Congresswoman and others in Washington, DC. And so they supported that. I brought my students for spring break and I was the field director and you can imagine how tough I am. Don't I look tough to you? Uh, anyway, I had to learn all these rules 
And I had to sign contracts that I was responsible for the students and the students had to sign contracts that they would not drink liquor, take recreational drugs, not fraternize with the local people and that they would stay on the campus. So we went to Rajasthan thinking that we were going to be in the classroom, but Prisby, who was the head trustee had a different idea. He surprised us. And as he recalls, um, I came a few days earlier and he said to me, we're going to send your students into the villages and they're going to learn from the villagers. At which point I broke out crying because I had promised the university that we were going to be in classes. But then when I became more educated and learned what he was talking about, I thought, oh yes, they'll take, the engineers will take us in, we'll go on Jeeps, We'll see really what the ponds look like, how they refresh the ponds with the monsoon water, how they do uh, drip irrigation, how they capture water through rainwater catchment. And we'll learn how the local people survive. The Northwestern students. Let me go back here. Um, what Prithvi's brilliant idea was for the students and me and our crew to live in the desert for 36 hours. Now, mind you, we had no translators. If there was an interaction like you see between Andrea and the elder, it's because they figured out how to communicate soul to soul, not through words. But as in any situation where you put in a mix of very different people, there was some turmoil. And the turmoil came from two of the brightest students, engineering students, Mert and Yuri. They were not thrilled with the idea of experiential learning and they wanted to leave the campus for several days. Um, there was a huge fallout. The other students also wanted to do something and they did not like, they were chafing you know, at having to stay on campus. And the administration was very hurt and embarrassed from the Jabahagrathi Foundation that these students would question the wisdom of uh, people who lived in the desert and had been leading the water project for 30 years. I call this a clash of visitors and locals. And I'm gonna let the students- The Northwestern students study in the desert communities. Chris Plant explains the big questions he believes Northwestern students should ask. So come away with a lot. But it's an excellent question. Why am I here? And the answer is, I'm here to learn. It's, it's, it's something that you probably need to understand and probably need to absorb. Everything that has been told us so far is experience, learn, understand. Very liberal arts sort of stuff. I didn't come here to just, just experience things. I came here to do things. Not once have, has it been mentioned that we're going to do something. What Mert and Yuri decided to leave for two days. They want to create an engineering design partnership with the Barefoot College. Yet the students have different goals for what they want. I think everybody's interpreting the trip differently. I think some students sort of need to step outside of themselves a little bit more and sort of lose their sense of self and more realize that they have limited time being here. And the focus should be on consuming as much information as possible. It's kind of funny when you get a bunch of kids from Northwestern who are very, you know, go-getters, want to get things done, do things, create things and like see something happen, see like a tangible thing happen. I feel like if you're coming to India on a trip for maybe 10 days, I think it's not really possible for that to happen. It's incredible. It's incredible. Tensions flare as students weigh in with their own opinions of Mert and Yuri's decision. But I would not be able to live with myself if I just see this and then go back to Northwestern and act like this was a dream. These are people, they're suffering. How can we not do anything about this? Andrea explains her perspective on how the Jal Bahagarathi Foundation views the students and their mission. And I don't think that they, they, they feel like we have nothing to offer. Absolutely not. But I think they're more concerned about us getting the problems right, you know, versus going back and trying to come up with solutions. I don't think you can go into a situation like this with, that, with such a narrow-minded narrow-minded way of looking at what you're going to get out of this experience. What else do you think we have, JBF, you know, 
setting all this up for us. We're setting up a foundation for future things to happen. So that is the perspective from the students. Now, this is Kanapriya Harish, who is the executive director of the Jalbahagarathi Foundation. And she felt very disrespected. They have been in the desert community for 30 years with top engineers, nurses, doctors, teachers, um, trying to educate and work with the local population to improve the water situation. It's a true partnership. Um, she did not share this uh, situation with her boss, Prisby, who was head of the board, which I think shows how embarrassed and um, uncomfortable she was. Now, Gaston has invited me to kind of share how I felt. I will tell you that the 24 hours of the decision-making were some of the worst I've ever experienced. Um, the two young men broke their trust. They had told me that they were impoverished and that um, they could only come if they were on scholarships. So I made a special plea to the head of the study abroad program to give them scholarships. They had signed an agreement and the head of the study abroad program told me to send them home, that they would have a permanent black mark on their record. But if you've ever been a parent or someone responsible for other people, you don't really want to be the one to put a black mark on someone's record. And so I consulted with um, Bill Natale, who was our director. I considered, consulted with Jock McLean, who was a professor that, who came along with Geshe, the Tibetan monk, who was uh, also there to guide us. And we decided that uh, the two young men had already poisoned the situation there and to let them go. Now, this was not without danger because the Water Foundation was right at the um, margin with Pakistan and there was a military base there. So there was some danger there, but there was no way that I could hold the young men back. Um, what happened with us is that after three years of building trust, with, it, with our partners in India, that trust was jeopardized. And that was uh, maybe the worst thing about what was going on with this half million dollar project. So to recap, the UNDP funded an exchange between um, the Jabhagrafi Foundation and Northwestern, and I had to report back to them. The Northwestern students came to Rajasthan. Our host taught the students about the water crisis through experiential learning. Two students refused to follow the program, planned to leave and do something. JBF's Kanapriya was insulted and worked to keep the other students in the program. I responded to the study abroad, which told me to send the, the students home. So we had trouble. Um, the reason I'm recapping is that this is part of the case study. If you like, you might want to capture this with a screenshot on your phones because this is part of the problem that you're going to try and solve. Your task will be to go into breakout groups, choose a spokesperson for your group, um, and determine the most effective actions from three different standpoints. Now, I want to ask you first to go into the groups, introduce yourselves, choose a spokesperson, and then you will be assigned one of these three perspectives. The first is Mert and Yuri's perspective as future engineers for the social good. The second is JPF as host of the exchange and with 30 years expertise in water sustainability. And the third is my perspective as a field director and Northwestern representative and producer of the Water Pressures documentary. Again, you might wanna capture this on the screen. Okay, uh, excellent. And can, um, could you go back two slides to, to give yeah. uh, folks um, a, an opportunity to take a screenshot as a, as a reference for, for your group? And, and then can you proceed to the next slide, Anne? 
Right. So, um, and Jessica, um, could you open the breakouts, please? And uh, don't join just yet, everyone, but you'll see um, which uh, breakout you've been invited to join. And uh, groups one, two, and three, please take the, the corresponding perspective here, one, two, three. And uh, group four, please take um, the, the first perspective. And group five, please take the second perspective. Okay, so um, is everyone, if you look at your uh, assigned room, um, actually, I think we should, we'll, uh, group, group room four has gotten smaller. So let's move um, room, uh, Jessica, could you- I'll combine four and five. Okay, great. And um, so then uh, groups one, two, and three, uh, please take the perspective that's listed on this slide. And group four, um, how about group four, you can choose. Uh, you can choose which perspective you'd like to work on. How about that? Um, and the, um, but before we go into the breakouts, now that you know which perspective we, we'd like to invite you to, um, to, to work on, uh, let's have a chance to ask questions about the setup so that um, if you have questions about the facts that are relevant to your issue, you can um, field those now before we, before we, we split. Yes, Sharon. First question is, um, what are we expected to come back and either report or debate? R report back on uh, the, um, what you recommend, what you think that okay. the, the actor in question should do at this moment of decision. This moment of decision when um, Mert and Yuri want to kind of uh, mutiny and go off and try to uh, respond to the water crisis as they see as future engineers motivated. And, um, and uh, I'll let Anne uh, respond further, but to, to respond to the case from the standpoint of the actor in question. Is, do, do you have a follow-up question, Sharon? Well, at, at this point in the story, how long has the group been there? They've been there, let's see, it's, it was about, a, I think they've been there four or five days. Okay. And, there's, and there's four or five more days. And so they're missing the three days um, at the heart of it, which is the overnight. Okay. And this is the point at which you needed to make a decision. Right. Okay. And, and again, just to be clear about the decision set that as you saw it and as it was presented to you, if you could follow the request from the Northwestern Study Abroad Office and eject uh, Merton Yuri or, or do something different, is that, is, is, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And how many total students were there at there that were there there at the time? There were a dozen. Okay. Were they and were Merton Yuri the only engineering students? Um, and no. were, there, were there any engineering students from the other the other so, from Grinnell? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I think there was an Indian girl from yeah. Grinnell. Yeah. There were future doctors, um, media students, um, writers, journalists. But in terms of technicians, like I consider an engineer more of a technician, um, there, there were just three, the three engineers out of the 12. Not sure. Okay, all right. Other questions um, to get this the setup clear. I mean, the 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 goal of the of the breakout now is to look at the set of facts from the standpoint of responsibility, whether it's Mert and Yuri's sense of personal responsibility and also budding sense of professional responsibility, um, the the sense of responsibility of the foundation, which has for decades been working on water issues and is now in the middle of this new partnership with Northwestern University and then 
Anne, who has been the bridge and, and feels uh, you know, important responsibility on multiple sides of this issue. Hi guys, I'm, I arrived a little late at Susan. Sorry, I don't have my thing on, but um, so I, I don't, I'm meant to be doing Merton Yuri's perspective, but I don't really know what they want to do. I didn't get that. Maybe I missed that. Yeah. I still, I saw her from the, you yeah, have no idea like where they think they're going. Well, that's part of the follow-up story, but they, they think that they can create a partnership with a local organization to, to get involved in water. But I think you've identified one of the problems is they don't know anybody there. They don't speak the language. They don't have any resources, so. Um, and with 30 years of work being done in the area of that area of Rajasthan, um, I assume there's been some sort of progress over that over those decades, correct? There's been a huge amount of progress. Okay. Yes, right. Um, there have been partnerships with um, corporations, academia, other small water organizations from around the world. I mean, this, this is kind of one of the leading small water organizations in the world. Okay. All right. I have, I have enough of my questions answered for group four. Uh, okay, um, so this is your chance. To, I mean, in fact, you can come, you can, each group can have somebody come back to the main room and, uh, and talk to Dr. Feldman. And uh, after she gives you all a few minutes to get your conversations going, she might drop in. So this is not the last chance to ask questions, uh, but it's a good chance to ask questions if you have them, if you have them now. Otherwise, um, you know, let's go in and, and, and get into it. These are, uh, it's, these, it's an interesting and genuine puzzle of, of responsibility that, um, that presented itself uh, from multiple sides. All right? Good luck. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll call you, we'll send you uh, messages, but we'll call you back in 15 Great. minutes. Thanks. Thank you. Maybe we can start debriefing and as, the, yes, okay, so um, group one, could you, uh, could your spokesperson report where you got to? Yes, hello. Um, I'm going to be the spokesperson for group one. So um, we were um, thinking from the perspective of the young men. And so um, the first thing we really identified was that they had obviously, um, they had great passion. They, they had decided to jump ahead and step away from the program and they believed that they could create change on their own. Um, but they're obviously driven from a place of passion and belief, which is something um, to be harnessed and celebrated and uh, to uh, maybe the, the idea of uh, redirecting them um, was discussed. Um, so we, we also talked about the fact that um, this is obviously a new program and that you were working on and right. maybe this was the first time that you had um, been working with the students um, in, in this way and with, with this collective of people. Always, um, the young men uh, maybe uh, behaved disrespectfully uh, to the program and to the people that you were working with. Um, but we didn't quite understand maybe what the learning uh, experiences had been, but we recognized that maybe the, those learning experiences weren't resonating with the they um, So maybe there was the, uh, uh, the opportunity to sit with them and redirect them in some way. Maybe it was to a different program, or maybe it was to talk about uh, moves that could be taken in the future. Um, maybe it was like some incentive to, yes, you have these goals and maybe we can be redirecting you to these people at some point. Um, so yes, I think that's kind of where we landed. So from the standpoint of the students themselves, you were sympathetic, you, you were sympathetic to their orientation we were sympathetic to their passion and their intent, yes. We realized that maybe it was misguided and that they were jumping ahead. Um, they didn't necessarily have the tools to do what they were talking about doing, but we did recognize that we were sympathetic to their intent, yes. Yeah, the fact yeah. that they want to do good. Okay, all right. Um, good, Let, let's let's do a quick round, round uh, the, the, the groups. Uh, group two, you were looking at the perspective of the foundation who is the, the host here. 
Correct. Um, so I'll be speaking on uh, Group Two's behalf, and we were discussing about how, as host, um, if we consider that we are JBF, and how we would be offended by this whole scenario. Not just offended, but we also considered a lot of other perspectives. But we boiled down to this uh, particular point that when we talk about um, India, it's a very polychronic culture. and we tend to change our priorities and uh, uh time cannot be controlled so that's something that the guys should have had in mind um both both the young gentlemen so <laughs> and another it was an opportunity for both of them to build a relationship with this um collaboration that they had but um it did not go well however uh, the lady who was in charge at the jbf foundation she did not quite complain to vikram uh, as it was mentioned which shows that it this partnership was equally important for them as well even though they were offended it was equally important so um the deep rooted fact here is that um even though we are offended we want to bring a change but that cannot come immediately so that's something that they need to be patient with and another um when we again put ourselves in the shoes of the host we feel that um these young gentlemen should have been sensitized before uh, coming to the place they should have researched a little bit about which state they are going to be in because even if they look up what rajasthan is they would have known that it's a very deserted place and uh, not sure if they were aware that is going to be an experiential program or not but if they could have been accustomed with just the place and what they are going to be carrying out and if they would have also tried to um, search about how um, what are the water crisis and how the place has been in last couple of years they could have get us gotten a sense of what they are getting into so i think for the guys it came as a cultural shock and it it was natural for the hosts as well to feel offended so that was our conclusion So may I ask a question? So um I see this as a larger cultural problem that happens when especially when westerners or people who are look like they're in power or have more money come into a um, a more impoverished um distressed area and the inequity of the relationships and how that plays out um can you address that and how this might be a bigger issue than just these two boys correct um i think uh, we also talked about this that they come from a place of privilege and um they were quite not very sure about what to expect because um what they felt was it was right to dictate what they wanted and it was right to impose upon the community that they need an action to be done so i think they were speaking from a uh, place of privilege and i think they they were not quite sensitive about the whole uh, matter at place thank you thank you Nice. Great. And uh, Group Three, you are looking at uh, at Anne's own perspective, uh, bridging groups here. Uh, yeah. So we, similar to what uh, the previous groups have discussed, we were talking about how this may be a bigger problem, a bigger issue about the two students, and their reaction was very might, might have been motivated from their passion and their uh, desire to do to, to do the most good they could, but. from and perspective you have to consider many other factors you have to consider your liability to the university you have to consider your relationship with your partners in india you have to consider the like the end goal of the project so at the end of the day um you can try to sensitize these students about developing this greater level of cultural intelligence that might be needed when you go in a situation like this especially as and was mentioning when maybe like a westerner like goes to a place 
that's very different and there's a big uh, experiential impact. So try to keep things working. But at the end of the day, you have a project that's the end goal. And if the, if the ideas that these two students might have had are putting that in jeopardy, especially with the host and they're putting it in jeopardy with like the end goal of the project, although you may try to talk some reason into them, if the end decision is to send them back to Northwestern, especially given like the financial aid that was involved with their trip to um, with their trip to India, then that's uh, unfortunately the only thing that's left to be done. We'll we'll hear we'll hear what what actually happened. Um, I'm not sure I can share the slides, and there's nothing that has to be shared. So is it okay if I just talk? Yeah. Do, would you like to hear from the last group? Oh yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Great. So group four was the the group that um, that had the, the 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 discretion to choose the perspective. So um, let's hear from 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 group four. So I'm going to kick this off, but I'm going to probably share the stage with Jordan and Rosa. So um, we sort of, as a group, talked about the entire problem. So we took the macro perspective. Um, I'm going to start off talking about. Uh, and situation. So yes, as you said earlier, Gaston, Anne is in the middle, right? She's right here. She bridges the program in India and the university students. And there's her project at the very center of that. Um, and she thinks she's doing a great thing by providing this sort of access and insight to university students. It's only a 10 day program or so, right? So for two engineering students who haven't graduated yet, right? They're still engineering students. To think that they can come into a culture they know nothing about, that they don't speak the language and, and branch off and solve a problem that's been in solution mode for 30 years um, is audacious and it's offensive to JBF. So at the same time, Ann already mentioned that she, she didn't wanna put a black mark on their their, their records, right? Um, and so I think recognizing, like other people have said so far, recognizing that those two students are driven by passion and that it, because they are so young and so enthusiastic about this, that's a great thing. And I would think that were I or, I or my group were Anne, we would praise that first because you always start off with the good and then say, what you're what you're asking to do or what you're intending to do is offensive to your hosts and the school that you came from that arranged for you to be privileged enough to be on this trip but in the same way that I wouldn't want a third year engineering student to build a bridge that I drive across I think their time would be best spent learning they are students to learn the situation as best they can and to reserve their passion and solutions for when they get back to school. And then they can arrange larger groups or Anne could introduce them to the people that are on the solution side so that they can start to collaborate um, and, and offer young, enthusiastic, state-of-the-art engineering solutions to the problem and understand why the organization in place hasn't made that same progress in 30 years because there's there's asking a simple question but it has a very complex and when you're in a culture like uh Diwani was saying it's it's not so simple i i posed in the chat if after 30 years they live eight hours walk from water why don't they move but the i know the answer is much more complex than that. People don't leave where they live in general. It's an emotional thing even. So that would be my, my perspective for and Encourage them, tell them to reserve their passion for later when they can really affect change, when they know more about the situation, when they are better engineers. And Rosa? 
Awesome. Thanks, Sharon. Yeah, you summarized the majority of what we talked about, which is great. And um, one other aspect of our conversation that we wanted to share was sort of the relationship between JBF and Mer and Yuri, and then kind of looking at JBF's perspective, because um, a lot of the group has talked about what Mer and Yuri could have done better. We were thinking a little bit about uh, potentially how JBF could have capitalized better on the passion that these um, men brought to the um, uh, to the trip, and in terms of maybe looking at like you know how they could partner long term or um, maybe take some of those ideas and and in, like think about together like how that could fit in with the plan for these 10 days but then potentially a longer term plan where those um where Mert and Yuri would be able to potentially um you know elaborate on 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 their learnings and then actually implement a long-term um strategy and solution so I don't know exactly how JBF would would do that or or even what they may have done in the actual situation but maybe there was a little bit more opportunity to work together and part of that would be on JBF send to to welcome this like enthusiasm and see how it could be actually um, you know implemented um, in the long term. Um, but of course, there's still that onus on Mert and Yuri of seeing that longer term lens um, of the situation and knowing that like to Sharon's point, like they couldn't um, you know resolve um, these issues that have existed for for um, throughout history within these you know um, ten um, days. Uh, so I also, I just wanted to welcome Jordan to say anything more if if you wanted. I know we've we've kind of touched on a bunch of the points but yeah I don't want to don't want to take up too much too much more time it's kind of just this I don't know myopic western perspective that you know I you know the way I think about it is so prevalent in business nowadays where you're kind of just taking you know not necessarily nowadays it's starting to change a bit but where you're not thinking about all the stakeholders you're not thinking about your your community your employees this and that you're kind of just thinking about your profit very myopically without kind of the externalities of how that decision is going to affect, um, you know, the community in which you operate. And what we kind of talked about JBF is, is bringing everyone in to invite them to ask these questions in a very direct way. Like what has succeeded, what not, like, you know, no kind of, no, if I don't, it's hard not to, say like they shouldn't be offended or, or this or that but really just like laying bare on the table like okay you want to you want to come up with a solution then like what what is your solution like what what is the plan here really get these students to explore it they're not understand kind of cultural um the cultural effects that their decision might have and, and the different impacts so that's kind of the way I, we were thinking well, I, I, everyone who's spoken has really given kind of a fresh perspective and I really appreciate it because these are bigger issues than these two young men and this Indian nonprofit and, and our documentary. I think that, that is, as you just said, these are the issues that happen when a corporations come into to developing countries. Um, I was talking to a young woman in the fashion industry, you know, how do you deal with water and sustainability when you have this demand for new fashion? Um, what do you do when cultures clash, when people are not speaking the same language, when they don't really know each other? So there are larger issues. Um, I'm going to wrap up my slides kind of quickly. I'm not going to show slides. I'm just going to give you the, the high points. Um, Mert and Uri left for three days. They went to the Barefoot College to see what that was like, and that's a very fine, fine program in India. But Yuri wrote to Bill and said to me, he said, in retrospect, we were arrogant and fairly oblivious in those years. And I must admit that I cringe when I think back on the commotion we caused. But for the other students, it was an experience of a lifetime. And as, as one person said, JBF wanted this partnership to work. So they came, the two leaders came to our campus for a week or 10 days. And then I took them to DC to meet with some government officials. But the big part that, that ended up happening, which is what I was hoping for, is that, that students would become engaged in issues around water. And we brought in IBM as a partner. So us, a lot of the engineering students worked for uh, IBM students for a smarter planet. And in fact, you know, all these years later, IBM is still sponsoring programs at Northwestern. Uh, Bono, 
the musician, his one.org took our water pressures documentary and educational programs as their project for a semester with 200 colleges across the country and made it um, an initiative that the students worked on. And I also worked with Columbia University and University of North Carolina water centers on trying to set up partnerships. Many students in the US and Dominican Republic, Afghanistan, other parts of the world did short videos about local water issues, which, which were very um, heartwarming and personal to the students. And that's something that I would encourage your students to do, um, to do a, a video or a podcast or some kind of a project on the internet. One of my students started a national campaign to get college students to buy used blue jeans. Why? Because in order to distress one pair of blue jeans, it takes over 3,000 gallons of fresh water. And that's a lot of wasted water. So she did very well on that campaign. And then Mert and Yuri, through their uh, engineering, their little group called Design for America, ended up designing inserts for the the dishwashers in the um, dining halls at Northwestern that were uh, a low water use. So they took that passion and they took kind of their uh, feelings and they channeled it into something that they could do locally because really the answer is act local. They couldn't really act in uh, Rajasthan because they didn't have all the tools, but they could act locally. And I guess my challenge to you is what will you do for your water futures? Because the future of water is up to you. Um, Gaston, I'm gonna hand this off to you to talk about the classes and what your plans are, please. Excellent, thank you so, so much. And I mean, the, the first thing I'd like to say is that the, the challenge that you faced, in some ways um, it follows from an enviable fact as an instructor, which is, uh, getting that hot, hot emotion about a subject. Um, and it, it was the fact that they, they were overcome and, and, uh, and also rash and, and arrogant as, as they, they confess, but to, uh, to strike something that stirs that level of passion is, is pedagogically powerful and, uh, and, and it's seared, the project seared into the memory of those students and, and has had you know, incredible ripple effects. Um, uh, so despite that challenge that you faced, it's, it's emblematic of the power of the project um, that, 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 you, that you undertook. In, in, our, um, in, in the strategy course that I'll be leading this, this semester with, um, with our, our new students and, and our fellows, uh, we will be uh, uh, tackling water through, through several cases and, and we will be working to produce um, some uh, multimedia uh, representation of that engagement. And uh, for any student who is not in, in our strategy class or uh, anyone else on this, uh, in this meeting who would be interested in uh, participating and, and pursuing a project like this um, in collaboration and with uh, you know, the leadership of a larger group, I am uh, I'm committed to, to working with you. So uh, please let's stay in touch. Um, I know that some of you have already indicated interest. Just send me an email and, and we'll, we'll loop you into this. And those of and you in the I also, I also offer myself um, as, a, as a resource. Um, my email is my name, A N N F E L D M A N at gmail.com. And so I welcome any opportunity to work with you. It, wonderful. So um, that's that, that, you know, this is a to be continued. Um, uh, situation, and um, I, I hope that the the, the passion that uh, that Anne encountered with her students is has kind of uh, become contagious here, and that that we um, we leave uh, some some further records of of this engagement with the, with the water issue. So, um, Anne, I know that you know you and I had in mind uh, a nine, 90 minute session. I think that in fact maybe some um, members of the community um, anticipate a one hour. So I guess I'd like to open the floor for any, any questions or follow up from you all for, for Anne or, or for the group uh, before we, we wrap up. I'll go ahead. Um, what kind of progress in the end has been made it, with JBF in this part of Rajasthan up to, to, to now? Well, first place, um, 
they made tremendous progress capturing rainwater. Um, I mean, this is a community that has no electricity that the government has forgotten. There are no pipelines. There are no electrical lines. The community is so impoverished that they don't have money. So when you talk about, well, they can just up and leave, they can't, they have no resources whatsoever. So what they've been able to do is um, on many fronts, number one is capturing rainwater. Number two is separating animal reservoirs where the animals can drink from where the humans drink because um, it was unsafe water with feces and everything else in the water. Um, with Northwestern, I was able to send doctors and nurses and some technical experts from the engineering school to Rajasthan. But I think my biggest personal contribution was anecdotal. Um, when I slept overnight in the village, I was at a young woman's home and we went up on the roof for a 20 minute breather while she was cooking. And she cooked over a cow dung because that was the only fuel she had. So she was always coughing and getting ill. And I saw her hobbling and I, you know, pig Latin, I made the motion, give me your feet and I'll rub them. No, 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 I said, give me your feet. So I, I no foot reflexology, I worked on her feet and the story got back to Prithvi and to the whole, to the Maharaja, to the water organization that, you know, Anne worked on this woman's feet. And so they asked me about that. And I said, you know, the skeletons are being destroyed from carrying that much water on their heads for such long distances. And I really think that your foundation should look into this. And they're still thanking me because they took that issue to an international conference because the men in the community are not allowed to touch a woman that's not their wife. So, no, and you know, how many men touch their wife's feet? It just was, it was an ad hoc situation. But because of that, I feel like personally, I had a long-term effect on uh, research about the health of these women and their skeletons and their reproduction and everything else. So, yeah. Something you completely didn't plan for. No, and that's the beauty of a project like this is, is to go with the moment. Right. Is to truly go with the moment. Um, I know we only have a few more minutes, but if there are any other questions or comments, I'd love to hear them. Well, I, I hope we have the, the chance to, to recruit your, your assistance in, in multinational uh, learning in the future. And because there, there's certain things you can learn by travel that you can't learn in any other way. It's true. And I thank you all because every one of you came up with something fresh and new and exciting for me to think about. And, um, you know, I thank you for sharing your energy and your time with me. Thank you so much. I learned a ton. Good. This was a great Likewise. way. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Gaston. Thank you, everyone. Becky, thank you. Yep, uh, glad we could do this uh, all together. Um, and uh, we'll see many of you tomorrow evening for induction. <laughs> thank, you. Right. thank you. Thanks, Anne. Good night. Good night. <laughs>